Good morning, y'all. Today we're going to do a little uh, oil change and preventive maintenance on the Gen XJ. Uh, you know, some of y'all probably don't need to see a video about changing oil, but there's probably some out there who've never done it. Uh, you know, there's lots of kids nowadays who grow up and uh, they're just not taught this stuff. So we're going to go through it and uh, that way if you've never done it before and you want to do it yourself you'll know how to do it so the first thing that I do right off the bat you want your engine warmed up your vehicle warmed up and when you pull it in the shop or in your driveway however you're gonna do it the first thing that I like to do before I shut the engine off is to uh, go ahead and check the uh, transmission oil because you need to check it idling with the engine warmed up and the transmission warmed up. Just like anything else, you pull the dipstick out, wipe it off. Then you can go ahead and shut the engine off. Now something to remember, if you check your transmission oil and it's low, before you add oil to it, you need to check your transfer case because the transfer case Sometimes if you blow the rear seal in the transmission, it'll pump the transfer case full of oil. So you gotta watch out for that. Let me see if I can get this set up where you can see this down here. All right, hold on a minute. I gotta redo this camera. I'll be right back. Okay, so now we're under the truck and you've got your oil pan for the engine right here. And this is your drain plug right here. Mine happens to be 14 millimeter. Uh, yours may or may not be the same size, they, depending on if you've replaced the plug or different uh, aftermarket plugs, some have different size. So you'll have to get the right wrench. But one thing you wanna remember is you see this plug is in the back of the oil pan and it's pointing this way. So when you pull this plug, the oil it's not you don't want to put the oil pan straight under the plug right away it's going to come out so you need to put the oil pan back and it's it's kind of a guessing game but once you've done it a couple of times you'll know where to put it and you, that way when you take the drain plug out the oil will come out and it'll still get in the pan and then as well you'll see you'll you'll have to move it back as the flow gets less so that you're not getting basically your goal is to not get the oil all over the floor so let me set the camera back on this mount so we've got our oil pan we've got our 14 millimeter wrench Loosen that and should be able to. Now, depending on how sensitive your hands are, the, all this stuff under here is hot. Now, I've been doing this for years, so my hands tend not to get burned quite as much. But once you get this coming out of here, you'll want to be ready to catch it and there we go, right into the pan. So, as that's, now you'll see as the flow gets less, 
then you can move the pan back until you know it's going to be underneath that. And you may get a little on the floor. That's what cat litter is for. Let's put some cat litter on it. Some of y'all may want to wear rubber gloves doing that. That's fine. However it suits you. So anyways, once you've got that drained down enough where the pan's underneath the uh, hole and it's draining, you can go ahead and roll out. And while that's draining, we'll do some other maintenance that needs to be done. So usually while that oil's draining, I go ahead and check the oil, the air pressure in the tires, check the brake fluid, power steering. So you got your brake fluids here. You can see the level on the side. One thing to remember though, is uh, all my brake pads are new, so it's right up to the full line. But as your brake pads wear, this line, this this will come down. So if it gets to the add line, you want to check your brake pads. You don't necessarily want to dump a bunch more brake fluid in here because when you go to put new brake pads on and you compress the uh, calipers, all that brake fluid is going to come back up in here. And if you've added a bunch more, then it's going to overflow this. So keep that in mind if you add brake fluid. You got your power steering here. You want to check it. We're good. And you got your air filter box. You want to check the air filter out and make sure it's clean. It's just got some spring catches on the side of the box. There's one here. One here one here on this side there used to be one on the other side but it's gone and then you kind of lift it up and you got to slide it over because there's tabs on this on this back side and we just pop that off then you can pull your air filter out check it out this one's still pretty good we can put her right back in there. Don't normally replace them every time you change your oil, only when it's dirty. Get that back in its tabs and put all your snaps back on, just like that. So we've checked the air filter, we've checked our other fluids, you can check your uh, overflow tub here, down on the side. This one's good. It's got a full mark and an add mark. So once we've done all that, then we're gonna check the air in the tires. So this will depend on what tires you have, but like these are these uh, BF Goodrich, and you can look on the sidewall and it will tell you what the maximum tire pressure is and this is 35 psi cold now i don't run these at 35 psi what i do is i generally will air down when i go off road down to about 12 psi but on road generally i will alternate between 25 and 30 psi and the goal is to get an even tire wear. Uh, also, for tire wear, normally when I change my oil, I also rotate the tires every time. Now, I'm not going to do it this time because I rotated them last week after I got done readjusting the steering. But the bigger your tires are, it never hurts to rotate them. And so I just go ahead and do it. Some people do it every other oil change. I do it every oil change with the bigger tires. 
because these are expensive and if you can avoid getting a wear set in your tires they'll long they'll last a lot longer so let me grab my air chuck and i'll be right back okay so i've got my air chuck here hooked up to the tire and you can see right there we've got about 25 psi in there so we're going to go ahead and set these at 30 this time around all right so that's 30. so we can pull this off put our little cap back on i'm going to go ahead and do that to all the rest of the tires and I'm not going to film it because it's just put, putting air in the tires. So I'm going to put 30 PSI in them now. And then the next oil change, I'll drop it back to 25. And what that does is as you put more air in the tire, you'll poof the center of the tire out more than the outsides. And so you'll wear a little bit more there. So I, I alternate between 25 and 30. It just gives you a nice even tire wear. You don't want to wear out one side, the outsides or the center of the tire before the rest of it's done. And, and again, I air down when I go off-road. This is strictly for on-road driving. This is also my daily driver. So I'm going to go ahead and go around and put 30 PSI in each tire. And then uh, I'll get back with you and we'll uh, look at changing the oil filter and uh, what oil and filter I use. So... Be right back. Okay, I've got 30 PSI in all my tires now. That's what we're going to run for this go round. One thing to remember, check the air in your spare. Now, on a lot of our 4x4s, that's real easy because it's mounted on the back of the Jeep. But if you're changing the oil in a pickup truck or a car or an SUV, it's liable to be mounted underneath the vehicle. It's liable to be mounted inside of the back underneath a panel in the floor. So if you got a bunch of stuff in there, you're going to have to move it to get to it. But you want to check that air in that spare because that spare tire does you no good if it's flat when you need it. So do that. All right. So we check, we're going to check our battery. Now I've got an AGM battery, so I don't have to worry too much about um, corrosion and leaks, but... Check your terminals and your hold down. Make sure they're not all corroded up. Make sure that they're not loose. Everything's tight. We're good to go there. So now we're going to uh, change the oil filter. Now on these XJs, the oil filter is... Uh, I'm going to have to get the light so I can show it to you. Hold on a second. So the oil filter is on the passenger side of the motor and it's right down there. You can see it screwed on. Now I'm going to get it from the bottom, but that's, that's where it is right there. And, uh, so let me get everything set up. See if I can get the camera under there where you'll be able to see it and we'll change our oil filter and get our plug back in our oil pan so i'll be right back okay we are back under the vehicle we're going to put our oil drain plug back in now your drain plug has this plastic ring on it and that's what seals it so you want to make sure that it's in good condition and not cracked or split or anything they sell replacements at the parts store and so we're just going to stick that back in its hole and thread it up in there. Now I want you to remember, I went ahead and looked it up just to be sure, but the number one th mistake that a lot of people make is over tightening this drain plug. And if you look it up, the for this vehicle, 
is 20 foot pounds is all the torque that that's supposed to have on it and 20 foot pounds is not a lot so when you tighten this you don't want to over tighten it you just want literally 20 foot pounds that's not a lot of torque because you do not want to over tighten that and end up having to replace your oil pan because you stripped out the drain plug all right so we'll put the drain plug back in and the reason i do that is because then i can scoot this oil pan back out of the way because we don't want to spill it and i've taken a rag and put over the oil that spilled on the floor and let soak that up so now we've got to change our oil filter so I've got myself another drain pan here and the big problem about this filter is it is mounted right there you can see it right up there and when you loosen it it's going to drip oil down all over this suspension and such and normally what you would do is loosen that and then uh, let it drain into a pan while you're doing other things but I don't like to make a big mess all over my stuff so we'll see you how it does and it's kind of a, a pain because it's in a spot where I can't really get my hand onto it that good and yeah, I'm going to have to get a wrench. All right, hold on. I'll be right back. i got to get a wrench. Okay, I've got my filter wrench. So one thing you need to be aware of is if you got to use a filter wrench on this, and I can't really show it to you while I do it because there's just not enough room to get the camera at an angle that can see it. But you need to be very careful because you've got the terminals on the back of the starter not very far away and you do not want to short across those as you're trying to get your filter off and this may not this wrench may or may not work we'll see it's not a lot of room here oh yeah there we go we got it started moving get a couple turns on it here get the get the um, o-ring to break loose once you get this turn in you can usually turn it with your hand so there we go alright so we got that loose get this out of the way and also, when you pull this filter off, again, you want to make sure that you don't short it out on your terminals on that starter. So one thing you can do is you can take a rag, and again, I'm sorry, I can't really show this to you while I do it, because there's just not enough room to get a camera angle on this. But once you look at it you'll understand what i'm talking about you can take a rag and put it over that those terminals to kind of protect them and as you start to loosen this then you'll see the oil will drip out of it just like that Basically, we're going to let that oil drip out of there into that pan for a bit and then unscrew that and I'll be right back. Okay, once you've got your oil filter down out of there, which here it is, in the old one in the pan here. I don't know if you can see that, but hopefully you can. You want to make sure when you take your old oil filter off, which this is the new one, but you want to make sure this gasket is out of there and comes with it. 
because you don't want a double gasket that'll cause a leak you take your little oil on your finger and put a little coat of oil on your new gasket and then once again I apologize that I cannot show myself screwing this on up in here but there's just not enough room for me to get oh, everything up in here so you get it up in there and screw it back on where you took the old one off of and it should thread right on there by hand and it should spin right up on there now what you want to do is spin that oil filter on there hand tight and basically once you've got it up against there there's lots of standards I basically go with hand tight plus three quarters of a turn and unfortunate thing is with the placement of this filter it's very difficult for me to get a good grip on it to tighten it but the good thing is much like the uh, drain plug you really don't need a ton of torque on these things I mean you want them good and tight you don't want them to rattle loose or anything but you don't need to uh, over tighten it either. So, I get it good and tight and I can tighten these with just my hand. I don't even put a wrench on them to tighten them. The problem I have here is just not that much room, but. So that's good and tight and now let me get all the drain pans out from under here and we'll talk about filters and oil and all that good stuff. So I'll be right back. Okay, so we got our old oil out and pulled out from under there. And we're gonna have to put the new oil in there. But let's, let's take a minute to talk about oil and filters so, you know, a lot of people on the internet, they'll tell you, don't use this brand filter, don't use that brand filter. I'm not going to tell you any of that because, one, over the years, I've used just about every kind of filter, and personally, I've never had a problem with one. Um, and for years, I drove Volkswagen Beetles. They don't even have an oil filter. You just change oil every 3,000 miles. But... You know what kind of oil filter you use is up to you i will tell you that i use a couple of different brands depending on which vehicle i'm working on um on the cherokee and well on any of my vehicles i use a wix filter i like wix filters the cherokee gets wix filters the scout the international engine gets wix filters um, we've also got a 2020 Chevy Colorado that my wife drives and it gets Wix filters or Mobile One uh, filters that are made for synthetic oil. Uh, we also have the Toyota RAV4 and it gets either Toyota oil, factory oil filters or Wix or the uh, Mobile One. And generally, it just depends on which one of those three is least expensive at the time I restock. I usually try to keep two or three oil filters for every one of the vehicles in the shed, just so that they're there. Um, brands of oil. Uh, in the Cherokee, I use this Valvoline high mileage, semi, uh, it's a synthetic blend. Um, in the Scout, I use this uh, Motocraft diesel oil because it doesn't have a catalytic converter and the diesel oil has got more zinc in it, which it needs for the flat tappet cam that it has. 
Uh, on the two newer cars, the Colorado and the Toyota, they get Mobile One. Uh, the Toyota gets the high mileage. The uh, Colorado gets the regular Mobile One oil. Um, I like Mobile One oil. Uh, I had a Silverado that had over 300,000 miles on it when it got T-boned. And even after 300,000 miles, and it had Mobile One in it since the day it was new, even after 3,000 miles when you'd go to change the oil, and I would change the oil when the indicator said so, it, sometimes it was 5,000 miles between changes, and the oil was still clean. It wasn't, you know, clean, clean, but it was, you could still see through it when it was draining. So, I mean, it was, that was some good oil. Um, I don't put the synthetic oil, pure synthetic in the Scout or the Cherokee, uh, because they started life with regular oil. And a lot of times if you put the synthetic oil in a vehicle that started out for years with regular oil, it just causes problems. And it's, you're not really gonna gain anything by it. Regular oil works just fine for them. And especially on the Scout, uh, the synthetic oil just does not have the additive package for the uh, flat tappet camshaft that came in those international engines. So that's what I use. Um, what you use is up to you. Again, I'm not going to tell you this oil sucks or that oil's good. Um, I use what I use because over the years that's what I've uh, come to trust. Uh, I really like the Mobile One synthetic, but uh, I don't want to run pure synthetic in this Cherokee because the old six cylinder in it, you run synthetics in something that's been running dinosaur juice and you tend to get a bunch of leaks and I just don't want to deal with that. So I run the semi-synthetic and then the Scout gets pure dinosaur juice. You go put synthetic in that engine, it's going to cause nothing but problems. So. Now that we've discussed that, got that out of the way, um, we've changed, we've dropped the oil, we need to put the new oil back in. And so, if you don't know already, when you go to put the new oil in, so there's our new oil filter down there. You can see where it says Wicks on the side of it right there. And the new oil goes in right here, if you didn't know. I know most of y'all probably know this, but you never know when somebody who's really needing to learn something is watching this. And since most of my vehicles are more aimed towards learning you something than entertaining you, I try to go over even the stuff that most of us just know. So we'll put our funnel in there and we'll put the new oil in there. So let me get that done because I can't hold the camera in this bucket of oil at the same time. The old, uh, as as we call them at work, the five quart gallon. <laughs> so I'll be right back. Okay, we've got all our oil in here. Uh, we cranked it up, let the oil filter fill up, made sure we got oil pressure, checked underneath. Made sure there's no leaks on the floor of oil. And we're good to go there. Rechecked our oil level. It's right where we want it to be. So I usually will add that five quart gallon, as we call it. That five quarts of oil. And then you usually have to add a little bit more to bring it up to the completely full mark. About three quarters of a quart or so. It, it just depends. Um, so we've got all that done. The oil's changed. We're ready to go. The only other things we've got left that we haven't done yet is to grease the chassis and to check the oil in the transfer case and to check the differentials. Now, the differentials I'm not going to check today because this front differential, I fixed a leak on it last week and checked the oil then, so I know it's full. The rear differential, I know it's full, and also I've, I've got some new Yukon axle shafts coming. And they'll be replaced. I'll be doing those day after tomorrow. So there's no sense in messing around with that. But normally you would just pull that plug 
right there out of the differential cover and check your oil level and add some if it needs it also same on the rear now greasing the chassis i'm not going to show you me greasing the chassis and this is the grease fittings on here well let me find one. yeah there you can see that one right there so there's the grease fitting for that upper ball joint um and the reason I'm not going to show it, show me grease and all this is because, one, it's boring. And two, every vehicle, especially Cherokees, because so many people have modified them over the years, they're all different. Um, you'll find some, and there won't be a grease fitting on them. All of the joints are sealed, tie rod ends, drag link ends, everything's sealed, and there's no, you don't grease them. They're non-serviceable. Same with the U-joints. But... You want to look over your Cherokee or your any car you drive very carefully in the front end. You want to check all the tie rod ends, drag link ends, your upper and lower ball joints, your control arm ends, uh, your whole drive line you, for U joints, um, and make sure whether you have sealed units or greasable units. Because like on my Cherokee, all of my U joints front and front axle and drive line and rear drive line are all sealed so i know there's no grease fittings on those um but i do have grease fitting there is a grease fitting inside the double cardon joint on the rear end where the slip yoke eliminator is got to grease that now on my front axle both upper and lower ball joints have grease fittings because i've replaced them with ball joints that have grease fittings Tie rod ends have grease fittings. The, both ends of the drag link has grease fittings. Um, all of my control arms have grease fittings. So it just depends on your vehicle. Um, but basically, um, grease your grease fittings. So I'll do that after I get done with the transfer case. And I'm going to show you the transfer case. And tell you one thing you need to watch out for with your transmission and transfer case so if when you checked your transmission you had it was over full and especially if you knew that it wasn't over full before well then probably what's happening is your transmission is leaking into your transfer case so this is your transfer case here, right here, and the plug that you need to check is right here. So if you pull that plug out and two quarts of transmission fluid are all piled up in here and flow out of there, well then you know that you've probably got a blown transmission gasket. As where the transfer case bolts to the transmission, there's a seal. The transmission oil and the transfer case oil, they may use the same kind of oil, but they don't share oil. So just something to keep in mind when you check this to, uh, you know, if it's over full, then chances are you've got a uh, blown gas, blown seal between the transmission and the transfer case. So keep that in mind. So, also, you probably have grease joints on these um, slip yokes on your drive line that you need to grease. All right, let me roll out from under here. Because I brought the wrong tool with me anyways. Uh, transfer case on my other vehicle has a big nut on it. All right, so that's what you basically what you're going to do if you're going to service your vehicle. And, uh, you know, how often you do it is also a personal thing. You know, some people swear by every 3,000 miles. I think in with, with fuel injection, that's kind of a waste of oil and time. I tend to do, well, our newer vehicles, the Chevy and the Toyota, they have the little indicator on the dash that tells you when the oil needs to be changed. And I just go by it. 
Um, on this vehicle, I go by is I go by 3,500 miles on the odometer, which is actually I did the math and it's just a hair less than 4,000 miles, actual miles, because of the uh, the tires and I haven't changed out the gear for the speedometer. So, uh, but we're using semi-synthetic oil and it's coming out. It's not, you know, it's not black as night. And uh, this engine doesn't get fuel in the oil. It doesn't, it's not, you know, all the injectors are new. It runs good. So there's really no sense in changing it every 3,000 miles. So I do 4,000 basically. Now my Scout, it gets changed um, basically every other year, but it, you know, it doesn't get driven that much. So uh, there's no, uh, I'd be surprised if I put 3,000 miles on it in five years. It just drives around town and goes to car shows. So that's about it. So that's going to be it for this video. Hopefully it helps some of y'all out. And, uh, We'll see you in the next one. Y'all have a good one.